It's spring at last. The sun is shining, the birds are singing, the flowers are blooming, and the world is full of life and new opportunity. In my first lecture, you learned about why we need a paradigm shift, why we need people, not things, in our interactive entertainment. In my second lecture, you learned about the personality model I've developed as well as the mathematical system that accompanies it. In this lecture, you are finally going to learn how to use the Encounter Editor. I will walk you through the entire process. Begin by launching the Encounter Editor. Here's what it looks like. Don't freak out. I'll show you how every part of this works. The very first thing you must do is use the Open dialog to open the file called Cboot Encounter List. There's already a bunch of stuff in there. Once you've learned how to use the Encounter Editor, you can study these encounters to improve your understanding. Encounters do not take place in a vacuum. They're always associated with a story world. The whole point and purpose of encounters is to provide a different form of interaction with characters that have already been defined. An encounter is one small piece of a much larger story world. The encounters you see in the encounter editor are all part of the Seaboot story world. The Seaboot universe is described in a series of short stories tracing the history of the colony. You'll need to read those stories before you can start composing encounters for use in that story world. The characters in the story world are inhabitants of the colony. The personalities of the characters have already been defined for you. So have their relationships. However, relationships can change due to events. Encounters can change relationships. Indeed, that's their entire purpose. The Seaboot story world is populated by five main characters. Zubin al Ganubi is a sweet young lady, rather naive and perhaps a bit too gabby. Everybody calls her Zubi. Koopi is something of a character, long known for his practical jokes. He's getting on in years, though, and the rough edges of life have hardened Koopi. Subotai is a rather bland character, having no striking personality traits. She's about as normal as you can get. Kamigdo is ambitious, talented, uh, sneaky, and definitely determined. Scordicott is tough, fierce, and intimidating to all. Nobody messes with Scordicott. He does have a soft spot in his heart for Zubin el Ganubi. So let's cook up an encounter. Let's use the case in which the player character notices that another character has left their fly open. Our first step is to create the new encounter. We do this by going to the upper left corner of the window and clicking the button with the plus sign. Up pops a little dialog box asking for the name of this encounter. Let's call it, um, Fly is Open. Now the window looks like this. All the fields are empty. All we have to do is fill them in. The first one to fill in should be the name of the author. The button for that is in the upper left corner. Right now it says, by nobody. Let's fix that. We click on the button that says, by nobody, and then we just type in our name. Now we turn to the first real job, writing the text for the opening story. It's called the introductory text, and the space for typing it is in the top center of the window. We click there and start typing our story. Okay, so let's enter some text now. It is a dark and stormy night. Suddenly, without any warning, you notice that antagonist has left possessive singular fly 
open whatever in the world will you do you're probably confused by these odd phrases antagonist and possessive singular notice that they are set off by equal signs that indicates that these are special markups they will be replaced by whatever text is appropriate to the current conditions. For example, if Scorticot is the antagonist, then the text will look like this. But if Zubin el Ganubi is the antagonist, then the text will look like this. Next, we turn to what we call prerequisites and disqualifiers. These are advanced features that allow you to control the conditions under which an encounter might appear. You might not want an encounter to appear until after another encounter has already taken place. Then that other encounter becomes a prerequisite for this encounter. For example, suppose that you don't want this uh, fly is open encounter to appear until after a previous encounter in which the player was humiliated because they left their fly open. Then you'd want that encounter to be a prerequisite for this encounter. We add a prerequisite by clicking on the button with the plus sign. A pop-up menu appears, and we simply click on the encounter that we wish to be a prerequisite for the encounter called Fly is Open. Disqualifiers operate in exactly the same fashion, only they specify encounters that would somehow disqualify our Fly is Open encounter. For example, suppose there were an encounter that uh, somehow destroyed all the clothing in the colony. Then we couldn't have anybody leaving their fly open, could we? That would be a disqualifier. Now, as a beginner, you won't need prerequisites or disqualifiers, but later on, when you start building large numbers of connected encounters, you'll find that prerequisites and disqualifiers are absolutely necessary. The next set of features allow you to exclude certain characters from playing certain roles. For example, suppose you had an encounter in which uh, one of the characters pees on a pole. Well, you couldn't have females doing that, so you'd have to exclude them. On the other hand, if you had an encounter in which somebody gets pregnant, well, then you'd have to exclude the males from that role. Here's another minor feature. You can specify the time window in which an encounter is allowed to take place. Most of the time you won't need this, but occasionally you'll have an encounter that really has to take place early in the story, or perhaps you'll need it to take place late in the story. That's what this feature is there for. Recall that options are the choices you give to the player. This is how you put the player on the horns of a dramatic dilemma. You should give the player every dramatically reasonable option you can think of, but you must also keep those options clearly distinct from each other. Don't give the player a choice between laughing and giggling and chortling. This is where you enter the text for your options. You're allowed five options. You simply click on the text field for each option and then type in the text representing that option. So now I've entered the text for each of the three options. My next task is to create the reactions that the antagonist might have to each of those three options. Let's begin with the first option. I click in the text field for that option. Notice that the border of that option is now thicker. That tells us which option has been currently selected. First we go to the lower right corner of the window to find this section. This is where we specify the emotional reaction of the antagonist to the player's choice of this option. Now, this is a pretty nasty option, so it's not going to endear the antagonist to the player. 
I figure that doing something mean like this will make the antagonist like the player a lot less. So I'm going to set in a blending value of a minus 0.25. Now, this action is not going to affect the player's, the antagonist's trust in the player, but it will certainly have an effect on the p-timid dominant because it will humiliate the antagonist. So that will make them less assertive with the player. So I'm going to put in a blending change here of minus, uh, let's say, minus 0.4. With that done, we now turn to the most time-consuming task, setting up all the reactions to each option. Remember, the player has just humiliated the antagonist in front of everybody else. What kind of reactions might the antagonist choose? The first reaction is obvious. The antagonist is infuriated by the protagonist and responds threateningly. The second reaction still bespeaks anger, but it is not confrontational. And the third reaction represents a timid response. I think that these three reactions do a good job of covering the dramatic range of possibilities. Now we come to the most difficult part of writing an encounter. It is time to create the algorithms that will make the choice among those three different possible reactions. To do this, we'll have to take into account each of the three personality traits of the antagonist as well as each of the three relationships or p-values that the antagonist holds for the protagonist. Then we decide which of these six factors is most likely to influence the decision to choose a particular reaction. Now. You don't choose this first reaction unless you're a pretty nasty person. So I'm going to use negative bad good here. Remember, positive bad good tells you how nice a person is, whereas the opposite of that, negative bad good, tells you how nasty they are. For the second term, well, you don't threaten anybody unless you already feel more powerful than they are, so that means I should use P timid dominant. Lastly, I need to set the weighting factor between the two, and I'm going to use, I think the nice nasty factor is a bit more important here, so yeah, I'm going to use a weighting factor of minus 0.2. The second reaction would be chosen if the character is too intimidated by the player to threaten him, but is still very angry at him. Now, intimidation is measured with uh, minus P timid dominant, and so we use that for the first factor, and uh, propensity to get angry is uh, really measured by how nasty somebody is, and that would be measured by uh, bad good, or minus bad good. So I would use that as the second one, but I think that the intimidation factor plays a larger role here, so I'm going to weight this heavily towards that, using a weighting factor of, oh, minus 0.5. Now, the timid dominant trait can be uh, very confusing here, because the intrinsic value for a person is generally the opposite of the perceived value that person holds for other people. For example, let's take somebody like Zuby, who's very timid. That means her timid dominant value is negative. But when she looks at a powerful person like uh, Scordicott, she's going to see him as being very powerful. So her P timid dominant towards him will be positive. In other words, her intrinsic value is negative and her perceived value is positive. In other words, the intrinsic and perceived are generally the opposite of each other, and that trips up a lot of people. This, then, is the net result of my cogitations about the reactions that antagonists must choose among. But how do I know whether these algorithms are any good? How can I tell if they work the way I expect them to work? The answer is right here, the test button in the upper left corner.
When you click on the Test button, this dialog box will pop up. You use it to select any pair of characters. When you do so, the program will use their personalities and relationships to calculate which reaction the antagonist will select. That reaction will be highlighted in pink. If you select a different pair of characters, you'll get a different calculation, possibly with different results. There are 20 different combinations to try out. It's even more useful. You can change the weighting values of any of the inclination algorithms and see how that changes the final results. You can also change the personality factors and relationships used in the algorithms and see how that would affect the results. It even shows you the numerical results of the inclination algorithms. Compare the inclinations of these two reactions. The upper value, 0 0.30, is higher than the lower value, 0 0.20, so the algorithms choose the upper result. But if we change the weighting factor of the lower reaction, we can increase it until it exceeds the inclination value of the upper reaction, at which point the algorithm chooses the lower reaction. The value of the test feature is that it permits you to play with your algorithms. Try wiggling around the weighting factor or different combinations of characters. Try different personality traits or different relationships. By playing with your algorithms, you can develop an artistic feel for how they work. And that's a lot more useful than any mere mathematical analysis. It gives power to your designs. This encounter editor is really just an introduction to interactive storytelling technology. It's simple and easy to learn. You can build your first encounter in just a few hours. This encounter editor is designed to work only in the C-boot story world. However, if enough people express interest, I'd be willing to build a general purpose encounter editor that can work with any story world. But the greatest value of the test feature is that it will give you a, an introduction to the much larger Storytron technology, which is more complicated and correspondingly more powerful. Sheesh.